Welcome to the information session about Vancouver Foundation's Open Licensing Policy for Field of Interest Granting Program Applicants. My name is Trina Isaacson. I've been providing support to Vancouver Foundation to implement the Open Licensing Policy. I'm joined today by Rebecca Mullen, the Project Lead at Vancouver Foundation, responsible for launching the policy, and then Dave Doig, the Director of the Field of Interest Granting Program at Vancouver Foundation, will be joining us uh, a bit later for the Q&A period. I'll be doing most of the talking today, but Rebecca and Dave will help curate and answer the questions that come up during the Q&A. Before we begin, I want to clarify who this webinar is for and what we will cover. This webinar focuses on the open licensing policy, which impacts the field of interest granting program. If you're interested in other granting streams like neighborhood small grants, downtown east side small arts grants, or other program grants, this webinar is not meant for you as the open licensing policy currently applies only to the field of interest granting program. Also, if you have general questions about eligibility requirements or application instructions for the field of interest granting program, this webinar is not meant for you. We're specifically covering the open licensing policy and how it impacts the field of interest granting program. So now that we've confirmed you're in the right place, let's focus on what this webinar is about. This webinar is for organizations applying for funding within the field of interest granting program. Today, we will give an overview of copyright and open licensing. We will share key components of the open licensing policy and give you information about how it may impact your application. You may wonder why the move to an open licensing policy. Our goal at Vancouver Foundation for the policy is to promote intentional sharing of socially innovative ideas, resources, and knowledge across the charitable sector. Vancouver Foundation is committed to knowledge sharing as a part of its philanthropic activities. Our money comes from community and the benefits, including the knowledge, must go back to community. We want grantees to consider intentional sharing from the outset so that your socially innovative work can spread and flourish. While the policy is focused on materials produced by the field of interest grantees, and that's also the focus of this webinar, it also covers Vancouver Foundation's own research, program materials, and data. In developing this policy, we consulted with a number of current grantees, volunteer advisors, Vancouver Foundation staff, U.S. foundations working on open licensing, and a lawyer with expertise in artist rights, charities, and intellectual property. One of the barriers to sharing is that current copyright practices often discourage sharing, reuse, and adaptation. A few years back, Vancouver Foundation kept getting calls about some of our own resources, which we wanted other people to use. Our intention was to ensure the work was shared widely, but we had a problem making that intention explicit and clear to those who wanted to use the information. We wanted to remove any guesswork. We wanted folks to use our stuff without thinking that they were stealing, and copyright was not helping. Some people don't realize that when we express our ideas, for example, in art, on paper, in a photo, our work is automatically copyrighted. Even if we don't put a copyright mark on our work, that little C with a circle around it, it's automatically copyrighted by law, usually for the full lifetime of the creator, plus another 50 years. One evolution of copyright is that some reuses of work is okay, but how and when isn't always clear to the average person. There can be fear and confusion about what is allowed by law, hence the questions Vancouver Foundation was getting. Another evolution of copyright is open licensing. It's a tool that creators can use to make conditions of sharing their work explicit and clear. We know that shifting the paradigm to a culture of greater openness, sharing, replication, and collaboration isn't solved alone by using open licenses, but it's one of the barriers to sharing and learning that we've decided to tackle right now. And this is where Creative Commons comes in. Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization dedicated to expanding the range of creative works available for others to legally build and share upon. Creative Commons has created a set of tools called open licenses, and these open licenses are extensions of permissions in copyright law. By adding an open license to their own copyright, creators can give others clear permission to use their materials in specific ways. Vancouver Foundation is choosing to use them because they are the most frequently used and globally recognized licenses for sharing. They make explicit how things can be shared, reused, adapted, built upon, etc. They give clear permission. There are over a billion works and materials shared online with open licenses. 
Creative Commons open licenses are free to use. They're a specific mark or phrase you put on your work to make your sharing intentions explicit. You still keep your copyright when you use open licenses, you just add terms that explain how others can use your work too. Creative Commons is part of a bigger open movement that some of you will recognize. The open movement has been embraced by segments of a variety of sectors, libraries, scientific research, education, and software, etc. We're testing it out in the world of philanthropy and social innovation, but this is not an entirely new idea. Many sectors, big and small, encourage open and contribution to the virtual public commons. In philanthropy, knowledge sharing and encouraging others to replicate make better, make different, build upon, learn from, and avoid starting from scratch are things that we want to promote. We heard time and time again during your consultations that there's a lot of opportunity for the charitable sector to benefit from the intentional and explicit sharing of each other's knowledge, resources, and practices. We've listed some examples of the open movement in action here. However, our policy is slightly different than most of these examples because it focuses on open licensing of content created by our grantees in the field of interest granting program and by Vancouver Foundation. We want to share a short video that helps explain how Creative Commons open licenses work, what they look like, and how people use them. The video will also explain the various choices creators have that allow them to choose how their work can be shared, reused, and built upon by other people. Have you ever wondered how to download and share digital content legally? How do you let people know that you want them to reuse your own work? Creative Commons licenses can help you do both. We'll show you how. Our world's exploded with digital opportunities. Now we can communicate, share and work together using the exceptional distribution network that is the Internet. Information and content can fly between us in exciting new ways. But it's important to know that when something is created, say a photo, a document, or a music track, it's automatically protected by copyright. Copyright enables people to say who can share and reuse their creations. You must always obtain someone's permission before sharing or reusing their work, even when it's posted online. But what if a creator wants everyone to use their work, without the hassle of granting permission over and over? This is where Creative Commons can help. Creative Commons provides licensing tools that are free to use. You can apply a license to your work, which refines your copyright and streamlines how you give permission. Zach here downloads a photo called CC Kiwi that he wants to use in his science project. He can do this without asking Kiri, the photographer first, because she's already given permission with a Creative Commons license. Kiri's license is legally robust, but easy for Zach to understand. She's told the world, including Zach, that they can use CC Kiwi as long as they acknowledge her as the original photographer. There are more rules Kiri could have included. Creative Commons licenses are made up of license elements. You can think of them as rules, and each have their own special symbol. This is attribution. It means that Zach must acknowledge Kiri when he publishes his science project containing her photo. This is non-commercial. It means no one else but Kiri is permitted to make money from CC Kiwi. Tim wants to print the photo onto t-shirts and distribute them to friends. He can do this, but he must not sell them. This is no derivatives, and it means that Kiri hasn't given permission to change her photo. Kate can use CC Kiwi on her design blog, but will need to ask Kiri before retouching or mixing up the image. And this is share alike. It means new creations that use CC Kiwi need to carry the same license. Jack incorporates his own remix of CC Kiwi in his video installation, but he must share the work under the same terms that Kiri has. Each Creative Commons license gives permission to share and includes the attribution rule. So people who find your Creative Commons licensed work are automatically allowed to share it, but are required to acknowledge you if they do. The other three license elements are optional, and you can choose which ones to add, if any. Here are the six combinations that make up Creative Commons licenses. The difference between them 
is how many rules apply when someone wishes to use your work. The attribution license allows reusers the most freedom and the attribution non-commercial no derivatives license allows the least freedom. The attribution license and the attribution share alike licenses are sometimes referred to as free cultural works approved licenses. These three licenses restrict commercial use of a work. And these two licenses do not give permission for adapting or remixing. These two licenses require new works to be licensed under the same terms. To choose and apply one of these licenses, and to view their terms in more detail, visit us at creativecommons.org.nz Or you can answer some questions to help you decide which license best suits your needs at creativecommons.org slash choose. So you'll notice underneath this video screen, there's a Creative Commons a Creative Commons license referenced under the video. This is an example of what an open license looks like when another person, in this ca case Vancouver Foundation, uses someone else's content. The license shows the title of the work, who created it, has links to both the author and the location of the work online, and has a link to Creative Commons, uh, the license that was used underneath, so that people can read more about the terms they must follow if they want to use the video like we have today. Um, in our consultations leading up to this policy, we uncovered a variety of ways that grantees and the broader community can benefit from open licensing. Remember, the idea with the sharing of openly licensed work is to both give and take. We heard that open licensing can help organizations innovate faster, learn from each other's experience and insight and not have to create new materials from scratch, replicate good ideas and new contexts and avoid making mistakes others have made, save time and money, build recognition for the original work, demonstrate to funders the potentials for their dollars to go further, and finally, support a broader mission, you know, movements in support of our vision that go beyond individual organizations. We also heard about potential challenges with open licensing, which is why we built a responsive policy that puts licensing in the hands of grantees. Um, here are some highlights of the policy. The full policy is available at vancouverfoundation.ca under our work and follow that link to initiatives. But here are some key policy highlights. The policy applies to field of interest applicants starting in 2017. The first stream to open in 2017 that this applies to is the Environment and Animal Welfare Develop Grants. Accepting the policy is a condition of accepting a grant. There are check boxes on applications and grant acceptance letters. Uh, number three, the default open license we ask grantees to use is CC BY 4.0. Uh, and again, that was referenced in the video, but we will be sharing more resources about what exactly that means. But the default that we ask grantees to use is the most open. However, there are some circumstances where a different or a more restrictive license is appropriate. And we'll cover some of these scenarios on the next slide. Really important to note that grantees hold the responsibility of selecting a license and putting it on their work. If sharing work with an open license adds cost to a project, applicants are encouraged to include those costs in funding requests. We'll cover some examples of what those costs might be in a future slide. Uh, another important part of the policy, grantees are expected to openly license, uh, or sorry, share their openly licensed work somewhere online for other people to be able to discover. And finally, this policy does not change the way Vancouver Foundation grants. Yes, open licensing is now an emphasis for Vancouver Foundation, but we want you to apply it to things you are already creating and that are beneficial to share. The advisory committees that review applications have not been given new criteria to assess applications with. It's important to note that the learning for us is not over as we develop this policy. While many conversations led to this policy, it's not perfect and final. There will be questions and scenarios that we don't know exist and therefore we haven't solved for. As you come across new questions or scenarios, let us know. The policy will be updated over time as required and we'll also share and update our resources over time as well. Perhaps the most important thing to understand about this policy is that while we are promoting intentional sharing, the policy is responsive and selecting the license is ultimately in the hands of grantees. 
The default license promoted by the policy is the CC BY license, the most open one covered in the earlier video. The CC BY license means that when people use your work, they must give you credit, but are able to adapt, build upon, share, and use your work, even if they may earn money from it. As you've seen, there are more restrictive licenses available, but this is our default. Our goal is to encourage you to extend your influence, impact, and expertise among your peers. We're hopeful you'll share useful practices, that you'll remix and adapt resources and guides, and that you'll build upon each other's work to spur new innovations and solutions within your own work. However, Vancouver Foundation recognizes that not all things are beneficial for an organization to share. Whether something should be shared and what license should be applied or may be appropriate might vary in some circumstances. For example, you aren't the copyright holder. If you're not the copyright holder, you can't apply an open license to that work. Another example is if the work includes traditional Indigenous knowledge or sensitive or personally identifying information. The revenue from selling the work is crucial to the copyright holder's financial sustainability or the privacy of the work is crucial to the success of the project. So those are all uh, examples of scenarios when sharing with an open license may not be appropriate. In addition to the policy which covers this issue in more detail, Vancouver Foundation will be releasing resource guides to assist grantees with their evaluation process. These resources will be available online within the next two weeks. We know that each grantee is unique and will have different circumstances. This policy allows for flexibility. There will be situations we haven't considered or come across, and it's important that you let us know so that we can update our resources, provide more support, or even update our policy. Now, to get to the question that brought you here today. What does this mean for my application? Firstly, uh, at the basic level, you'll be asked to check a box saying that you understand accepting the policy is a condition of grant acceptance. Number two, you are not required to create something just for the sake of sharing it. We don't want to force busy work on you. But what you do produce, we ask you to view through the lens of this policy. With what you do expect to produce, for example, reports, scripts, videos, processes, budgets, etc., consider from the outset whether or not it's beneficial to you and the broader community to intentionally share it. What are you creating? What could be valuable to other organizations to use, share, adapt, or build upon? You may not know all the details at, that, at this point, and that's okay, um, but consider if you may need some additional resources to make intentional sharing happen. Here are some examples of related costs that might come up when it comes to sharing. Maybe a document that would have been for internal use only originally. You might want to spend some additional time evaluating whether it's openly licensable or spend resources on editing or graphic design. Maybe you need to pay more for a piece of work from an artist or contractor in order for you to hold the copyright, but we do note that not all artists or contractors are interested in uh, giving up their copyright. Maybe you need a lawyer to help you with a contract to clarify what part of the materials or intellectual property being produced you are the copyright holder of. Ultimately right now, for the application, you need to be asking yourself, will this impact what we produce for public sharing and therefore impact our budget? Do we need to change our budget? It's important for you and your staff to discuss this together. So, for example, fundraising staff and programming staff, because it's not just about money, it's about what is created through your projects. There are two unique scenarios we want to clarify because these situations have come up for a few grantees. Many arts organizations contract artists in their work. Many organizations work with contractors, partner organizations, volunteers, or other non-employees. Organizations need to be clear about who the copyright holder is. Many agreements and contracts default to artists or consultants retaining copyright. And you cannot openly license something that you aren't the copyright holder of. In many cases, when working with artists, musicians, or consultants, this means that you won't be able to openly license the parts of your materials that include their work. However, some artists or consultants are open to conversations about open licensing their contributions to your project. Also, Many researchers get funding from funders who already have open access policies. For example, SHRC, CIHR, Canadian Cancer Society, among others. If your project already requires you to comply with an open access policy, you are not required to apply an open license to the same work. This situation may apply to other types of grantees, but we definitely know this comes up for researchers in particular. 
So while this presentation is focused on applicants, we did also want to give a bit of insight into what this means once you've accepted a grant from the field of interest granting stream. First, you'll need to look at what you're producing, reports, scripts, videos, processes, budgets, etc., and determine what is possible and beneficial to openly license. This may mean breaking up some of your work so that just a part of it is openly licensed and publicly shared. Then you'll need to select a license, apply it to the material, and publish and upload the work online. You'll be asked to include links to published work in your final report. Vancouver Foundation will direct you to additional resources for you to help choose the appropriate license, help you apply it to your document, website, photo, etc., and direct you to places that make sense for you to publish your materials online. There are a few common questions we want to address before we get into the Q&A. The first question, how will Vancouver Foundation enforce this requirement? The short answer is that we will ask for links to openly licensed work in final reports. At this time, we are not planning strict enforcement. Right now, we're focused on learning, and we understand that this policy will require time, feedback, learning, and practice before it is a commonplace activity within our organizations. Number two, what if an applicant only requesting funding for part of a project? So this policy applies to materials or works created in full or in parts with Vancouver Foundation funding. This policy doesn't spread to whole projects or whole organizations, unless Vancouver happens to be funding in whole or in part whole projects or whole organizations. It applies to the materials or works created. You can voluntarily apply open licensing beyond the works or materials funded in whole or in part with Vancouver Foundation funding, but it's not a requirement. And the third common question is, where will Vancouver store all the materials? Will there be a repository? And the answer is, Vancouver Foundation will not be storing these materials or creating a repository. Grantees are responsible for getting these materials online in a place that makes sense to potential users. Vancouver Foundation will be collecting links only. We're building out our resources. The field of open licenses and philanthropy is a new space for us and for Creative Commons, so it is a work in progress. Please let us know when questions come up, and we'll continue to add and update our resources. The most immediate resource, if you have quick questions, is to email open at vancouverfoundation.ca with open licensing questions, and we'll be happy to answer you, and those questions will benefit others because we'll be able to update our resources. On the website right now, we currently have an overview, the policy, and a, an assortment of frequently asked questions. We also have a couple of planned resources forthcoming, so should I openly license this, which license should I choose, and how do I apply a license? Those aren't up on the website yet, but they are forthcoming. We'd like to open up the chat feature now for you to ask questions about the open licensing policy. We'll spend this time answering questions that are applicable to the most listeners, but we'll collect all questions in order to update our resources and provide more clarity on the website. Okay, so Rebecca has just opened up the chat feature, so feel free to type in your questions now. Um, we'll get started with some questions that we came uh, across when people were registering for the webinar. So Rebecca, do you want to come a bit closer to the mic? and? Yes, I do. Um, some of the questions that we received during the registration process were um, really great questions. Um, we may have touched upon some of these points, but we know that we've provided a lot of information quite quickly. Um, so I would like to um, answer this question right here. Um, our project involves contributions from artists and musicians. They may not want to work with us if it means giving up rights to their work. We're worried this will affect our relationship with them if we ask them to give away rights to their work. What do we do in this situation? Um, we want to reiterate that you cannot openly license work unless it, uh, you hold the copyright over it. The creator of the original work is the person who holds copyright, and in most cases when you're working with artists or musicians or other creative contributors to projects, um, they will retain um, the copyright over that material. Um, unless you actually have that conversation from the outset. Again, we like to remind people that what we're really encouraging at this point is for you to consider, as you plan your projects, what kinds of materials and, and um, outputs you will be producing and whether or not any of those would be beneficial to share. And so at the outset, you might realize I have a conversation with a musician coming up based on um, their contributions, we're going to have an agreement signed between us, this might be an opportunity to talk about our intentions to openly license some of our materials at the end. 
Um, if you're considering that kind of question from the outset of your project, you might say, oh, well, you know what? My organization doesn't necessarily have the skills and expertise to do that, or we might need a little extra time. How will that affect our budget? Um, these are the kinds of questions that we want you to be thinking about, and we absolutely would like you to include participants to your projects in this conversation about open licensing. However, we do understand that when you're working with artists and musicians, for example, they have many different kinds of complicated copyright um, issues already affecting them in their own industry. So in those cases, we would ask you to not include those works and consider what parts of your project, perhaps how you've structured the project or um, how you've oriented your program, what kinds of things would be useful for other people trying to do the same kind of work as you. That mm -hmm. would be a beneficial outcome mm -hmm. and a beneficial material to license. Yeah, we don't want you to negatively impact your relationships with artists or subcontractors that you work with by forcing them to openly license uh, their work. That's not a part of the plan. So if your agreement is that the artist or the contractor retains copyright, then they retain copyright and you won't be able to openly license that work. So some of the other questions that come up, someone asked us to speak a little bit more about traditional indigenous knowledge um, and what that means for open license licensing. So for those that um, are new to the idea of traditional indigenous knowledge, there's some knowledge that is held by uh, nations or certain uh, groups of indigenous people in Canada that don't align with the Canadian copyright laws. And so with Canadian copyright laws, there is a copyright holder. So an individual or an organization holds copyright. With traditional indigenous knowledge, um, there is no entity that actually holds copyright. And so therefore, there is no technical copyright holder. And therefore, an open license cannot be applied. There are actually um, licenses related to traditional indigenous knowledge that we can uh, direct you to if this is something that's incorporated into your work but we want to be really sensitive to the fact that uh, some traditional indigenous knowledge is not meant to be shared and so we absolutely respect that and we uh, our intention is not to require open licensing of traditional indigenous knowledge because we can't do that we see a really great question right here um, this is from Nikki. The funding application we will be submitting will involve the development of software, which will be very transferable and valuable to a wide range of groups. We are always happy to share our resources and believe strongly in this model. However, making a tool available to someone who can then turn around and make a profit off of it is a tough one to swallow. Is there a way of limiting that or using it within a sustainability plan to generate a bit of income within a CC BY license? Yeah. That is a really great question. We have considered it very carefully, and Vancouver Foundation's position is that there will be, in some instances, an organization whose sustainability or viability of the project that they are working on requires them to maintain financial control over the project that they have created. In this case, we would ask you to look at an alternate Creative Commons license. We have asked people to do the default license, which is CC BY, which is a simple attribution license. There are other licenses available. Mm -hmm. One of them is you no know, derivatives, one of them is share alike, and the other one is non-commercial. And what that means is you can apply that license to that, which allows people to use the work as long as they are not using it for the purpose of generating a profit. Um, and that would be the license that in this case we would recommend that you apply to your work. Yeah, so it's it's really important to know that the non-commercial part of Creative Commons license um, isn't just about restricting businesses from making a profit, it's about anybody earning a revenue. So if you want any other nonprofits to be able to use it and generate revenue, then it can get tricky. So this is a specific example where an alternative license um, will likely be more appropriate and if it's part of your sustainability plan and it's a part of your way to generate revenue to fund your organization then we don't want to negatively impact that and that's why we have uh, we describe that type of situation in the policy in noting that it's probably more appropriate for a different license to be applied in that situation. Uh, next question Rebecca? Uh, when assessing applications how much weight is given to the re ripple benefits of sharing resources produced as a result of the project. This uh, open licensing policy, while we're 
uh, spending an awful lot of time explaining it to you today. We want to reassure you that this policy does not impact in any way how applications are evaluated. Yeah. There's no new criteria for our advisory committee to evaluate your projects through. Um, Dave, uh, Dave Doig, the director of Field of Interest uh, Granting Program, is in the room. Um, currently, with the criteria that volunteer advisors use to review applications, um, sharing more broadly, not specific to open licensing, but sharing, I believe, is one of the criteria. Can you speak to a bit more about, uh, about that? Yeah, good morning everyone. Thanks for uh, participating on the webinar with us. Um, one of the assessment criteria we take a look at is how uh, meaningful the project is. And one of the indicators under that assessment criteria is how well will the project uh, enable community to continue to uh, move forward on the issue. And sharing resources through uh, the Creative Commons open licensing platform is one way to do it, but uh, as Rebecca said, there's no specific screening of applications mm -hmm. for the likelihood of um, res uh, resources being licensed. Yeah, and we also want to acknowledge that just sticking an open license uh, on a document doesn't guarantee it's going to be shared, so putting an open license on work is not sufficient in spreading your social innovation. So. Um, you can definitely mention it in your application, but make sure that you have a broader plan to spread your work beyond um, the original project. Uh, there's a second part to this question. Mm -hmm. um, it says, if the benefit goes well beyond Vancouver, for example, provincially, federally, or even internationally, does this increase the value to Vancouver Foundation, or are you more focused on the value to other Vancouver mm. organizations? That's a kind of a philosophical or like a interesting yeah. question yeah so that's a really great question um, again I'll reiterate that open licensing material is not a criteria or a requirement would we like to see you considering intentionally um, the broader exposure of your work absolutely yeah. we think that that would be um, probably the most beneficial outcome of this yeah. entire endeavor but it does not um, add weight to your application yeah. during the evaluation process. So interesting part of that question, you were curious whether um, it's about increasing the value to Vancouver Foundation or to other organizations, and the answer is both. It helps us extend Vancouver Foundation dollars, but it also benefits other organizations in our community and around the world that aren't necessarily funded by Vancouver Foundation, so uh, both are true. Um, I saw a question asking about uh, does this mean that you know sub agreements are required with all of the artists and uh, folks that we work with? Um, many organizations, when they work with contractors or artists, they have agreements that include an intellectual property clause just to clarify who retains the copyright and who retains the intellectual property. If you don't already have those sorts of agreements, we recommend that you you use them, and if you need uh, some help to get those set up, then include that in your budget. Um, it's really important to clarify who retains copyrights so that you as an organization, irregardless of open licensing, understand where you're able to use that work into the future. So um, we do recommend having agreements. I think that's a, a, a standard practice in working with others just to make sure that you have clear expectations about the working relationship and who will retain copyright um, when the project's over. Uh, another question we have is, you said you will not be focusing on strict enforcement now, but more on learning. Do you have a timeline and plan for when you plan on more strict enforcement? Uh, strict enforcement is not in the plan. Um, we are focused on uh, shifting a culture and not on punishment. So, um, I mean, that's the short answer. Our focus is on um, promoting intentional sharing, and this is not meant to be a stick. <laughs> and it may feel like it sometimes. We totally acknowledge that. Um, but we're we're shifting a culture and paradigm to to look at um, and to incorporate social innovation, the sharing of it, uh, and building and adapting upon the work of others and not having to start from scratch uh, every time. So strict enforcement, not on the radar. Yeah, I, I think I would even add to that by saying that learning and sharing knowledge is the uh, key interest for Vancouver Foundation. 
And we've decided to extend that to our grantees because we can see such an obvious correlation. Um, as a funder, we see a lot of applications and we see a lot of opportunity for those applications to improve, uh, to innovate upon each other's ideas. Um, and when we spoke in our com consultations, as we referenced before, um, the energy around the ideas of building stronger networks of practice and sharing uh, tools and capacity building resources mm -hmm. was really strong. Mm -hmm. um, that is is really the shift that we're looking for. Um, we are not interested in counting how many openly licensed materials we end up with at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and also when we're talking about work like this, if we look at other um, other movements such as open educational resources, um, open access and open culture in general, these movements take time. Um, and we're uh, in a respectful relationship with you right now, um, right at the leading edge of this. Yeah. And so when we say learning needs to happen, um, it's learning for us as much as it will be learning for you. Yeah, we, we spoke to a, 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 another funder yesterday who is was interested in learning more about our policy. And one of their comments was, you know, they often get applications from organizations for the same thing and they would love to see people, or organizations being able to start not from scratch every time and instead build on each other's work. And that's part of what we're trying, the culture that we're trying to create here. Uh, next question. Are you working with other local funders to get them on board with this idea? Yeah, great question. So we just had one conversation with another local funder yesterday. Um, there are other funders even nationally that are interested in this idea. Um, as as questions come up from other funders, we and say if you have to navigate a conversation with another funder, we're happy to help you out with that. We do want to spread the word about uh, open licensing with other funders, and we've been starting to have those conversations. So, uh, and we also, because we're focused on sharing Vancouver Foundation's own work, we want to support other community foundations and funders to be able to take what we've learned from this process and run with it rather than having to start from scratch like we basically are. Uh, as far as we know, we're the first uh, first, first community, community foundation, foundation in Canada that's doing this and perhaps even the first funder in Canada that's doing this. We're only about 18 months behind major foundations in the U.S. from doing this. So this is very new. Um, we're learning. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, unlike the way that foundations and funders like to be sometimes, this is going to be a little bit messy and we're, we're taking a bit of a risk and so we, we want you to come along for the ride um, as we learn from you and from our own experience. Next question. Uh, next question. What specific types of materials would you like to see organizations share? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's there's kind of two major pieces. One is the outputs of whatever a project or program is created. So, for example, uh, a guidebook or a script or uh, a report. And then there's the stuff that is that leads up to the final curtain or that leads up to the final publication, the processes and what went into making the project successful. Um, Rebecca, do you want to rip on that a little bit? Yes, um, we've seen um, in our, and I'm going to take directly from some of the things that we've heard in our consultations, um, people have been interested in elements such as how to construct a budget, uh, what's a 10 point social media plan for an organization that has one person trying to complete three tasks, um, as we know some of you will be. Um, there, there is definitely, it would be fantastic to see beautiful complete works, uh, music, videos released, posters, projects. Um, one of the other things that we've also considered as we've spoken to people is that um, you could consider open licensing as a new mechanism and tool to encourage the sharing and spreading of your idea. Perhaps you're operating a campaign. Um, putting an open license on your materials might actually enhance your ability to um, share those works in different kinds of communities that you haven't currently been exposed to. For example, putting a photo or a poster up on Flickr will automatically put you into a pool of searchable materials um, that might see wider access by people you haven't really considered. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're thinking that anything that increases exposure for your ideas or anything that you want your peers to know about your success mm -hmm. or your lessons learned yeah. will be effective. It's about 
obviously spreading your social innovations, but also helping others not having to start from scratch. So if imagine if you left your organization and were starting up in a new community and wanted to replicate that good work, what materials would you want to have access to so to not have to start from scratch? Um, and so it's, it's about the final outputs, but also about the processes. And, uh, and so in our resources we, that we are sharing online, there are some questions you can ask yourselves about what might be beneficial to share based on, on the project. Any other questions popping up? Um, this question is, um, have you considered how this would apply to public, public legal, legal information? information? Yeah, I think I don't want to get too specific with any one type of uh, grantee, but um, when we did our consultations, we met with volunteer advisors and grantees from a wide variety. We dug most into arts organizations and organizations that focused on um, um, working with Indigenous people because we knew that there were some complexities around that. We haven't dug specifically into public legal information, but we're happy to have that conversation to find out if there are some specific um, opportunities or implications for working in that in that area. We'd like to actually pursue that further, um, and we really do encourage you to ask that question um, to open at vancouverfoundation.ca, and we'll yeah. follow up on that. Yeah. Um, one question here, given that VF is not maintaining works in a repository, what are the expectations for longevity, durability of funded works online? Um, really great question. Um, that, um, that, is a, that is an interesting aspect of this. We decided early on that we were not going to collect materials and host them because when you stop and think about, you know, who is the official voice on um, access to food in communities. People don't go, oh, it's Vancouver Foundation, I'll go to their website and find that material. We realize that um, you are the experts and the materials that you share should come from you and ideally be linked to you from your website or in, in different places where you traditionally share your information with each other. Um, one thing that we also have decided is not to solve for ourselves is the searchability of this material, which is why the second reason why we are not creating um, a repository. Um, while there are different places where you can contribute your material, where it is easier for it to be discovered, we cannot guarantee um, that this material will see 20 hits because you've produced yeah. it. Um, the content will be searchable um, through Google in the traditional ways. Um, and we do know that um, Creative Commons, the organization itself, is working on improving search. So um, at some point within the next five years, we have high expectations that if you've applied a license to your work, um, there will be a tool and a mechanism to specifically search for that material. Yeah. It's not a problem that we can solve at this time. Yeah, and if you're asking, you know, how long should it be up on your website for, um, or, you know, guaranteeing that it will be available online for two years or ten years. We don't have specific rules. Um, we want the work available online and as your program grows and changes over time, um, we realize that older materials might get lost, but the idea being that if it's openly licensed, other people can pick up that work and use it and share it and, and spread it. And so even if your website link no longer works in the future, it might be somewhere else and other people can benefit it and, and, it's, and it lives on in that way. Um, another question, what if a project is funded by two different funders and they have a completely different licensing policy? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is, I think that question will come, uh, or the answer will be based on the individual situation. Most funders, though not all, most funders uh, give the grantees uh, copyright over the materials that are produced as part of the project and so therefore you have the control to do openly li open licensing but if you do come across a funder with a different license restriction um, let us know and that might mean that we have a conversation with that other funder and see what opportunities exist um, or find other solutions I think it'll be uh, I guess the, the short answer is we haven't come across that exact scenario yet because the first round of funding is open and we don't have a clear answer. Yeah, we're, we're okay saying we don't know and this we don't know yet. 
Will you have suggestions or resources that would help an organization figure out how to share those kinds of internal processes, as they may not have not done anything of that sort before? We'll, we'll definitely we'll curate some resources and, um, and make them available. That may require a bit, uh, a bit more worker time on your port and therefore uh, a bit of a different ask. For your for your proposal, so feel free to include any anticipated costs related to figuring out that work. Um, but we'll definitely that's uh, that's a type of resource that I've made a note of, and we will include that as we build out our resources. Um, and I would add to that as well that um, as more of your peers are contributing information, mm -hmm. you might actually have. Um, a, a guide or a template or a great example available to you within the course of a year, depending yeah. on what kinds of things other people um, produce and share. And so that's sort of the goal here is to help each other build our capacity. Yeah. So one question, if, this, if an initiative is already using the open licensing concept for resources, uh, will this be considered in the application review process? Well, now that it's a, it's a condition of grant acceptance, um, we're hoping that everyone will, and because the application or the review process by volunteer advisors doesn't include new criteria, um, it would be considered in the application review process only insofar that it's a part of sharing your work. Um, but we don't have like a checkbox saying, oh, great, they're already open sharing or open licensing and they get extra bonus stars. That's not how it works. So um, we expect that this will be a part of um, many grantees applications now. Um, and if um, I take an alternate view of interpreting this question, okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm not entirely sure which way to go with it, so I'm yeah. glad we're doing both sides. Um, if an initiative is already um, working within uh, an open sharing policy or construct, mm. we do not require you to add another layer of open licensing yeah. to your work. Um, we're not here to create extra complexity. We understand that embracing and understanding this work is complex enough. Um, mm -hmm. If you're already working within one of those, yeah. um, it would be great if you let us know. Um, that would be fantastic, yeah. but we do not require you to do excess steps in order to comply with open yeah. if you're already working openly. Yeah, so that example would have tied back into the research example on a previous slide where many researchers already are working under open access policies and we're not asking them to double up on the open. Um, the, the open policy required by other funders is enough for us. I've got one more question, um, and then I believe we're going to wrap up. Okay. The question is, if I submit the proposal way before the deadline, would you be able to help me in figure out, figuring out how open licensing would work? That would give me time to build that aspect in. That's a really great question about preparing mm -hmm. for intentional sharing. We currently do not have a lot of resources assigned to helping um, applicants individually create an open licensing or sharing plan for their work. It's something that we would like you to consider as you plan your own work. Mm -hmm. We are not the experts um, in understanding what is relevant to your community or to other people working within your field. Mm -hmm. um, and also when we are working with application streams and incoming questions, uh, we simply do not have the capacity yeah. to work with grantees on an individual level like this. We're very happy to collect questions and to the degree that we can provide resources or aim people to um, other other directions while they're thinking about this work. We're happy yeah. to try and do that, but our grant managers will not be um, providing that as a service throughout the application yeah. process. If you have ideas about how we can provide support for the most number of applicants with the smallest amount of resources um, and what that could look like beyond just sharing resources online, happy to hear those um, because it's really important. We know that because this is new for a lot of organizations that um, it's a new thing to wrap your head around and sometimes just reading stuff on a page isn't the best way to learn how to embed it into your work and so um, happy to hear suggestions from you on ways in which we could support grantees but not by not providing necessarily individual one-on-one -on -one support for every application because we do not have the resources to do that. Um, so let us know. 
Thank you so much for your questions. We yeah. know that there will be more that come up for you, especially as you prepare your applications. And we encourage you to email the open at vancouverfoundations.ca email address with any questions or concerns, and we'll follow up by email or phone. Um, we also encourage you to visit the open licensing section of vancouverfoundation.ca. It's under our work and then initiatives. The resources are evolving and being added based on our planning and from the feedback and questions we get from grantees and applicants. Um, any final comments from Rebecca or Dave? Just thank you so much for spending an hour and 20 minutes with us today. We really appreciate <laughs> your time. Yeah. Dave? Um, uh, also appreciate your time. Uh, if on Monday you're in the Richmond or Surrey area and want to come here, Vancouver Foundation, talk for another hour and a half <laughs> about something, then uh, I'm holding granting workshops. The details are uh, on our website, right on the uh, front page on our blog post called uh, Funding Social Innovation. So happy to um, uh, meet you in person and answer your questions then. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and that we will be sharing a link to it along with a transcript for those that um, have hearing impairments by Monday. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful day.